This module focuses on the early Middle Ages. From the Republic days, Rome had confronted the invasion of migrating tribes from the north and east of Europe. Collectively referred to as the Teutones by the Romans, these invaders were very distinct ethnic groups. Franks, Burgundians, Lombards, Angles, Saxons and Vandals, etc. Roman standards of living were a huge attraction for many tribes looking for new homeland. Richer foods and drink, an abundance of servile labor, warm winter quarters, etc. Citizens of the Roman Empire suffered civil wars, excessive taxation, recurring outbreaks of plague and mismanagement by weak, ineffective emperors. All combined, these conditions probably contributed more to the decline and fall of the Western Roman Empire than the barbarian hordes. After more than 800 years of security from foreign invasions, the ancient capital was plundered and its citizens were herded off into slavery. Around 430 AD, an army of Mongols called the Huns, led by their leader Attila, pushed the Visigoths back westwards. The term Middle Ages or Dark Ages is a vague term first coined by Renaissance historians who viewed the 1000 years between the glorious age of antiquity, that is the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations, and the revival of classicism in their own great age as a middle period of Gothic barbarism. In the East, the Byzantine Empire became Greek, turning away from its links to the pagan Latin West. In the South, the followers of Mohammedism swept up from the deserts of Arabia to establish an Islamic empire that eventually stretched from India to Spain. Survival was the fixation of Europe's invaders, with war and violence as a primary means to that end. The customs and social structures of these ethnic tribes were born of the harsh experience of migratory life of barely sustained day-to-day -day survival in the brutal forest of northern climates. Survival also depended on stable populations with large number of women and children. Infant mortality rates were as high as 45 and life expect expectancy barely more than 40 years of age. Women of childbearing age were highly valued by the community. The family unit was centered on the protection of kinship group. Armed companions were always ready if a family member needed defense or financial assistance. The head of the family, for the purpose of ensuring the family's survival and extending its security, arranged marriages. A woman who was not a virgin was unmarriable and an adulterous woman was usually put to death since her offspring was in question, hence undermining the legitimacy of the parents and its hereditary rights. Male adultery, though, was not punished. Polygamy, too, continued as a sanctioned male privilege until the 10th century. Life in the early Middle Ages was fraught with violence and survival. In this chaotic world, education of boys was focused more on physical training such as running, horseback riding, swimming and hunting than the refinement of the intellect. The process of Christian acculturation of these invading tribes was a slow process. At the heart of the resistance was the parentella, the extended kinship group of blood relatives, in-laws, concubines, offsprings, slaves, etc., which the church ultimately destroyed by imposing monogamous, indissoluble marriages. Christian ideas emphasized the individual over the family, so that adultery, for instance, was viewed as much of a sin for men as for women. Furthering the transition was the creation of sacred spaces such as basilicas and monasteries to replace pagan temples. The pagan belief that one centered on fear of the external world was gradually and irrevocably countered by the Christian idea of hope and the eternal conscience of the individual. The main sources of information on costume used during the 5th and 6th century are two-dimensional images found in illuminated manuscripts, mosaics and rare frescoes in churches. Other information has been gathered from the bas-reliefs sculptures found on the walls of basilicas and monasteries as well as grave sites and archaeological evidence of clothing and objects that have survived through the ages. 
early Germanic kingdoms that appeared in the empire soon got destroyed. Among them, only the Franks survived. Clovis founded the Merovingian dynasty. The Merovingian dynasty degenerated into do-nothing kings who allowed their chief minister, called the mayor of the palace, to rule the kingdoms. In 751, Pepin the Short overthrew the king with the blessing of the Pope and became king. He was succeeded by Charles the Great, also called Charles Ming. He, dis he expanded the kingdom to Central Europe and southward to Italy. He encouraged the establishment of schools for reading and writing. Through this period, the eastern and western part of the Roman Empire were in contact through trade and economy. The king wore a tunic with sleeves edged with gold and a dalmatica over it. The hair length for men denoted rank. Cloaks and hoods were worn. In later years, men started to wear shorter hair reaching below the ears. Adult males kept beards. Boots were worn below the calf and shoes were also worn. The men of the Merovingian and Carolingian dynasty wore different types of costumes. Other costumes included gonelle. These were wide, loose-fitting, short tunics with bands of embroidery or woven designs belted to the waist. Braise. The upper legs were covered with a bifurcated garment called braise. Pedules. The lower legs were covered with knee-high hose called pedules. Paludamentum. It was worn with a crown by the king. Clavi was used to ornament the tunics along with borders at the neck, sleeve and hemline. The women wore a stola or smock or a chemise, inner tunics with long fitted sleeves, outer tunics or kirtle with shorter wider sleeves. Palla like shawls were worn over the layers of tunic. Decorated belts were worn over the tunics. Women also wore woolen pedules for lower legs. An outer tunic with a front opening was worn, often pinned up with jeweled brooches and pins. Silk veils, slippers and cross-gartered stockings were also worn. Gallique was slip-on boots. Clerical costumes. Roman Catholic priests, monks and nuns from the 4th to the 9th century AD tonsured the top of the head and fringes grew around the shaved area. The forehead was shaved from ear to ear. Other costumes used were amis. This was a strip of linen placed around the shoulders and tied in position from a collar. Alb. It was a long white tunic with narrow sleeves and a slit for the head opening. A belt was tied at the waist. Chasuble. This was very similar to the Roman pinula. It was a cape with sides cut shorter to allow arm movements. A Y-shaped band of embroidery called orphi extended from each shoulder to meet and form a vertical line at the back and front of the chasuble. The monastic dress consisted of a loosely fitted tunic with long wide sleeves floor length with a belt tied at the waist. These tunics were white, brown, grey or black. Nuns cut their hair very short and veiled their heads. Men and women went barefoot and sometimes wore sandals. These are the various components of their dress. Stole. This was a long narrow strip of material worn over the shoulders. Pallium. This was a narrow band of white wool worn by popes and archbishops. Prelates wore the band with one falling to the front and the other at the back. Cope. This was a voluminous cape worn for processions. Much is known about military costume because of the numerous warriors' graves that have been found. These were usually status burials of chieftains, clan leaders and princes. Warriors were fully dressed with numerous accessories like buckles, pins, jewellery, etc. When buried and sometimes even when even contained coins, furniture and remains of horses. The warrior's costume consisted of a corslet of chain mail and a metal helmet. His weapons were a spear and quiver of arrows with a bow. They also used a variety of other costumes. These include the corget, this was a throat guard, Francisca, 
regular foot soldiers used a shield and battle axe called Francisca. Scaramax, a large single-edged knife. Spangenhelm, the helmet was known as Spangelhelm. It had a pointed conical shape. It was lined with padded leather or fabric and cheek pieces were hinged to the base. The neck guard was welded across the back. During the second half of the first millennium, the rolling confusion of tribal migration and shifting empires kept Europe in a perpetual state of instability. By the 11th century, two widespread cultural institutions, Christianity and feudalism, had begun to provide some cohesion and coherence all across the land. Feudalism was an economic system based on land tenure. A king or land-owning overlord would grant a vassal the rights to a fief or agricultural estate that was paid for in service, usually military. As vassals came to hold ever larger estates, they often fought one another to protect or extend their lands, sometimes becoming powerful enough to ignore their obligation to the king. The many castles standing today with their thick walls, high towers and encircling moats recall this era when government was singular, personal and absolute. Christianity too evolved into an absolute force. The pagan barbarians had all been converted and the church's authority was present in every village. Vast number of monasteries and convents were founded during this era and grew wealthy from donations made by those seeking salvation. Even the head of the abbey was a member of the nobility giving a religious sanction to the feudal stratification of society into rigidly separated classes. Christian zeal was also demonstrated by frequent pilgrimages to holy shrines and by crusades to regain the holy land from the Muslims. In addition to expanding economies, vast building programs were sponsored by the church and the newly independent civil authorities of chartered cities. After the Carolingian Empire collapsed, feudal monarchies developed to protect against the invading tribes of Viking, Magyars, Saracens, etc. The central government and law and order disappeared. Security was in military might. Castles were built for the feudal lords as protective barriers and defense. The lord and his family had private rooms there. The castle was uncomfortable, cold, damp, dark and very windy. Windows were slits in walls without glass panes. Fireplaces provided heat in the winters and summers too. Luxurious items like carpets, tapestries, wall hangings, cushions etc. were brought back from the east. These courts attracted artists, poets, wandering singers, musicians and entertainers. This was also a ground to display fashion. Romanesque was the preferred style of architecture inspired by ancient Roman building featuring rounded arches, heavy walls, masonry vaulted ceilings and an overly blocky appearance of rectangles, cubes and cylinders. During the mid-12th century, some new types of construction inspired by ideas from the Middle East by the Crusaders began to replace the Romanesque style. This new style had lofty walls pierced with airy windows and high doorways topped by pointed arches. Soaring vaulted ceilings appeared to be delicate webbing stretched over seemingly insubstantial ribs. This style of architecture was called Gothic. The main sources of information for the 12th and 13th century were illuminated manuscripts, miniature carvings in wood and ivory, Romanesque architecture such as rounded arches, massive, well-proportioned buildings. The main highlight during this period was the development of the knight stirrup, which is the human plus animal plus sword, which equals lance-made weapons capable of shock combat. Warriors were trained to fight on horsebacks, uh, sword combat, etc. Training would take many years and serfs to take care of horses. These knights were called vassals or one who serves the Lord. The vassal uh, is offered military services in exchange of land or fief or fiefdom. Serfs came with the fiefs. Serfs' ancestors had surrendered their freedom for protection. 
they offered their services to the vassals. The feudal king was a supreme lord and ruler. He owned all the land in his kingdom. Feudal kings not only fought off invaders, but also fought other feudal lords. Armored knights, if defeated, were more likely to be captured and held ransom. Knights were also taught about chivalry, customs, manners, and costumes of the nobles. Pope Urban II initiated the first of the seven crusades to free the Holy Land from the Muslims. The actual motivation of each crusade varied from genuine religious fervor to outright mercenary designs for accumulating wealth and power. The crusaders brought back many new ideas and goods from their adventures. Printing patterns on textile was learned, foods, spices, drugs, artworks, fabrics like muslin, silk, damask, as well as cotton were introduced. Literary sources tell us about the emphasis fashion began to have in town life. Clergymen rely, rallied about giving too much attention to personal appearance and adopting immodest styles. Specialized tailors were trained to meet the demand of clothing styles. Men undertook the weaving process. Women were involved with the fiber preparation and spinning. Dyeing and fulling of wool were specialized crafts. With the decline of slavery, women workshops disappeared and textile production moved into the household. Technological changes like the spinning wheel, horizontal loom and water-powered mills changed the production capabilities of textiles. Craft and trade guilds were formed and regulated the number of artisans, standard of quality, rate of pay, working conditions, etc. Wives and daughters were hired, but women were paid lesser than men. Art was not solely for decoration. Art was supposed to illustrate to the uneducated commoners about Christianity and religious messages. Costume representations were more of the artist's time. Manuscripts that were written showed ordinary people doing seasonal chores. Workshops with lay artists undertook manuscript writing. Costumes depicted were sometimes imaginative, based on records given by soldiers of the Crusades. Tunics were made in linen, silk or wool and belted at the waist. Silk embroidery was used on the out tunic borders. For hunting, men wore practical shorter tunics. Necklines were round or square. Men's costume. Underclothing consisted of undershirt and underdrawers. The undershirt is a short sleeved tunic of linen. It is a predecessor of the modern shirt. Underdrawers or braids were loose fitting linen breeches tied at the waist with a belt. The length of the braids varied. The inner and outer tunic was usually long and sometimes the outer tunic was shorter. The shorter outer tunic had close fitting sleeves ruching at the wrists. The outer tunic had fitted sleeves or cut wide and full. It allowed the tun under tunic to show. Men also wore mantles, open clamour style and closed with a slit for the head opening. The mantles were square during the 10th century and became semicircular during the 11th century. Young men kept clean shaven faces. Older men wore beards. Hair was parted at the center and left loose till the neck and below. Helmets were worn during battles. Phrygian style bonnets were worn. Hoods and hats with small brims and peaked cones were also worn. Hose was a woven fabric cut and sewn to fit the leg, ending at the knee or thigh. Leg bandages, gaiters, linen or woolen strips wrapped around the leg till the knee were worn over the hose or alone. Socks were worn, shorter than the hose, bright colored with decorative figures at the hem. Boots, shoes and flat pointed shoes were worn. Leather and fabric straps were used for fastenings. For women, an inner tunic called chemise was used as an undergarment. Under tunics were floor length and close fitting sleeves and embroidered borders at the neck, sleeve and hemline. Outer tunics had wider and full sleeves worn with the belt. Mantles were worn for outdoors. Double mantles made with contrast lining and fur trimmings were also worn. Young girls wore their hair loose, flowing and uncovered. Older and married women covered their hair with a veil. 
pulled around the face under the chin or left hanging close to the sides of the face and ending about mid-chest. Women also wore hose. Footwear included open slippers, clogs, boots and shoes. Jewelry like circlets, which are headbands, neckbands, beads, bracelets, earrings, belts, etc. were worn. Costume features 12th century AD. The tunic fit more closely. Bleuot was a tightly fitted one-piece garment. Bleuot Giron, this was where the upper section is tight and attached to a flare skirt at the waist. Seams were curved to achieve closer fits. Lacing was used as fastening for these garments. Gores were attached to create fullness in the skirts. Seams were finished with tapes and embroideries. Satins and velvet fabrics were created and used. Concepts of modesty and changes against modesties are seen in this period. Lacings fall open and reveal bare flesh, which was considered immodest by the church clergy. Men used a number of different costumes. These include mantles, these were worn by men, sleeves were worn close fitting with decorative turned up cuffs. There was variation in sleeve lengths. Fuller sleeves were present for outer tunics. Sleeves closely fitted at the shoulder flared out in a bell shape at the hem. Men wore beards and moustaches and varied lengths of hair. Hats with a small tab or stem at the top were worn. Coif was a cap tied under the chin and was used by working men. Pointed shoes, these were considered immodest. For women, chemise and under tunic became more fitted. Bleuot Giron had pleated, crinkled and smocked variations. Sleeves were even longer and exaggerated with pendant cuffs and bands. Shens was a washable lightweight linen dress, long and pleated, was worn indoors. Mantles had collars with elaborate embroidery and adorned with jewels. Pelicon and pelisse were fur-lined or trimmed mantles. Women wore two plates hung on either sides, floor length sometimes. Ribbons had and decorative bands were intertwined with the braids. A loose veil was worn to cover the head. To cover the hair completely, barbettes, fillets and wimples were used. Barbet was a linen band that passes down one temple under the chin and up to the other temple. Fillets, this was a standing linen band over which a veil might be draped. Wimple, this was a fine white linen or silk scarf covering the neck. The center placed under the chin and each end pulled up and fastened above the ear or at the temple. During the 13th century, men would wear knee-length or shorter breas or breeches, a linen chemise, which is an undershirt. Over this, he places a coat, under tunic, and over the coat, a surcoat or outer tunic. In cold weather or for protection, he would add a cloak with a fitted cut. Upper-class men wore long coats, while lower-class men wore shorter coats. Two types of sleeves are depicted. One is long and tightly fitted, and the other is cut full under the arm, tapering to a close fit at the wrist. Some refer to this sleeve as a style Magyar. Cyclus is a sleeveless tunic or surcoat. Some surcoats were sleeveless with a round or wide horizontal neckline and wide armholes, the garment being sewn closed under the wide armholes. Another surcoat had sleeves to the elbow or three-fourth arm length or long sleeves cut full and wide under the arm, tapering to the wrist. Long surcoats were often slit to the waist to make riding and other movement easier. Even short surcoats and coats worn without a surcoat had slits sometimes in the front. Mantles were placed over the shoulders and fastening across the front with a chain or ribbon remained a symbol of high rank or status. Garnash was a long cloak with cape-like sleeves. Often lined or collared with fur, it was open at the sides under the arms. The herigo, tabard and fichets were costumes used in the 13th century. These are the other garments used by men. Erigo was a full garment with long wide sleeves and a slit below the shoulder in front through which the arm could be 
slipped, leaving the long, full sleeve hanging behind. In some cases, the top of the sleeve sleeve was pleated or tucked to add fullness to the sleeves. Garde corps or garde corps also seemed to be a similar garment. Tabard was a short, loose garment with short or no sleeves that was worn by monks and lower class men. Sometimes it was fastened for a short distance under the arm either by seaming or fabric tabs. In later centuries this became part of military dress or the dress of servants in noble households. Fichets, slits or fichets which look like pockets were made in more voluminous outdoor garments to provide warmth for hands. Hair length was moderate and parted in the center. Younger men wore shorter hair than elders. If beards were worn, they were short. Coifs and hoods were the most important head coverings. Some hoods no longer had attached capes. Hoods fitted the head more closely and some were made with a long hanging tube of fabric at the back. The French called this cornet and the English a lyre pipe. Footwear. Closed shoes that buckled or laced, open slippers, shoes open over the top of the foot and having a high tab behind. The ankle and loose fitting boots, rarely above the calf height, were all worn. Both long and short stockings were worn and the use of footed hose increased. For women, coats had either fitted sleeves or sleeves cut full under the arm. Sleeveless surcoats were cut with wide armholes through which the coat beneath was visible. Sleeved surcoats ended somewhere between the elbow and the wrist and were generally quite wide and full. Some women in the summer wore the coat over the chemise, but this was considered daring and a sign of immoral behavior. Some women laced the coat tightly to emphasize their figure, which were visible through the wide armholes of the surcoat. Women of high rank wore ceremonial open mantle both indoors and outdoors. Women usually wore the herigo and less often the ganache, which was of, for the most part a man's garment. Young girls continued to wear their hair uncovered while adult women covered their heads. Long braids were no longer seen veils and hair nets covered the hair. Barbets, fillets and wimples remained although they were placed over a hair net instead of a veil. No major changes were noticed in the women's footwear in this period. Accessories were largely limited to jewellery, wallets, purses or other devices for carrying valuables and gloves. Earlier reserved only for nobility and clergymen, gloves were used more commonly towards the end of the 13th century. Some were elbow length, otherwise wrist length. Women wore linen gloves to protect from sunburn. Purses, pouches and wallets were suspended from belts. Important jewellery items include rings, belts, clasps used to hold the ribbon that fastened the mantle and a round brooch, fermai or a fiche used to close the top of the outer tunic, bleot or surcoat. Perfumes and ointment from the Middle East were used. Rouged dyes and face creams were also used. The military used a range of different kinds of armor. Soft armor made of quilted fabric or leather that had not been subjected to any hardening processes. Mail is made of interlocked metal rings. There were also plates of metal, hardened leather, whalebone or horn. These could be large and small. The Bayo Trapestry is one of the most important sources of information about the appearance of medieval armour. Hauberk or, or Burney is a male shirt knee length with a slit in the front for ease of riding. A hood of mail was worn to protect the neck and head. Chouses or shoes are male leg protectors. Some merely covered the front of the leg while some were more like hose. Helmet. On the head and f over the male hood, the warrior placed a cone-shaped helmet with a bar-like extension that covered the nose. Mid-12th century, men began wearing a surcoat over the armor. In later periods, soldiers wore surcoats decorated with a coat of arms that identifies the force of which they belong. In the 12th and 13th century, Armour consisted of a coat of mail, hose and shoes of mail. The sleeves reached over the hands to form a sort of mail mitten. The whole outfit weighed about 25 to 30 pounds and was worn over a padded garment. 
In the early 13th century, a closed form of helmet was developed. It was closed at the back with slits for eyes and breathing holes. Placed over the chainmail coif was a small padded skull cap that protected the head from the ridges of the helmet. It was worn only during combat. The use of helmets brought about changes in lifestyle. Men kept shorter hair and clean shaven to avoid discomfort and heat. Common foot soldiers were not equipped with chain mail. Their protection was limited to quilting coats worn under the armor to which they might add quilted leg guards.